Well, if the question is who would claim to govern, or rule for that matter, at least some parts of the Iranian plateau, then one needs to count in all living entities on Earth, even the butt-burned pussycats of Sinjar and Kobani. It's better to ask, assuming, however an impossible assumption in my opinion, assuming that the Islamic Republic of Iran should suddenly disappear, which groups have the minimum requirements for replacements in forming the political system to be? Answer? No one. Other than certain circles from within the wide spectrum of the existing political system and the nucleus of the ruling power, which inevitably means the reproduction of what already exists in a posture and dimensions more robust, more complex and more intelligent than what we already have. Simply, the Islamic Republic of Iran as a construct has no opposition per se, but does have obstinate, jealous and vindictive antagonists, as many as you like. Well, in, in a nutshell, the A to Z of the Islamic Republic of Iran adversaries are those who have sulked with everything existent and non-existent in a self-destructive manner. Pig-headed, if you want to say. Yet, of course, one must be fair. If you listen to their stories, they dig up all the old graves and mourn about the brutalities of time, and you would feel sorry for them. And perhaps you could understand what the reasons behind all their obstinateness, jealousy, and vindictiveness are. But opposition is a whole other matter and has its own technical characteristics. Well, see, for any antagonist group to be in opposition, the characteristics are twofold, theoretical and practical. Any opposition must ascertain that the ensemble of its thoughts spring from what exact and will route reading of political philosophy. Also, to ascertain that its political manifesto is at what sort of an exact and categorized relation with the actual, not propagandist, particles and principles of the political system in power. Well, the more you investigate the talks and at times writings of these different sort of groups, the less you find anything other than overgeneralized buzzes and slogans. You see, all these non-stop rattling drumbeats over keywords such as democracy and freedom and human rights. But they never explain what exact reading of any of such general notions. Also, they never define that beyond the avarice for haphazard defamation and insult spreading, what the relation of the existing political system with their own reading of the optimum and exact situation is from an objective perspective. Well, see, the Islamic Republic of Iran enjoys a solid and structured foundation in political philosophy in which the principle guardianship of the jurist, contrary to what some proponents of this principle think, is only a segment of the crust. Now, whether this specific school and exact reading of political philosophy is good or bad or sublime or whatever is another subject for another discussion. In opposition and not any heap of obdurate and jealous fossils must calmly and rationally decipher the real and exact position of the Islamic Republic of Iran within the matrix of political philosophy and realities that dominate the present-day world. You see, then it needs to codify the coordinates of its hopefully cultivated thoughts, presenting alternatives and experimental approaches relative to the status quo. But the antagonists of the Islamic Republic of Iran do not even hover close to such an approach, as if they've got no taste into that direction. Mere paratalk, repetition of democracy and freedom and all such mumbles. First of all, let me stress that I consider the unfamiliarity with the 
policies of the Islamic Republic of Iran only as a virtue of the antagonist groups. I believe that the gigantic and meaningful majority of Iranians inside the country, whether they should be from the middle class or below that, even if they should have thousands of grieving from their conditions of livelihood, do fully comprehend the necessity for the strategic presence of their country in transboundary affairs and in West Asia. The same applies to the Iranian diplomacy towards the US, Europe, elsewhere in the world, etc. etc. Hence, I also stress that there might be more suitable alternatives for each of the policies currently pursued by Iran. But the nexus of what I'm saying is that none of the antagonists of the existing political system provide no one with any meaningful and experimental policies that could play out as rationalistic alternatives for the standing construct, construct of policy making, if I may say. Now, as an example, let's look at the Iranian missile policy. Just assume that all I argued about the non-existence of real opposition should be null. We accept that there exist solid and structured oppositions that are mighty in all their aspects, with righteous foundations in both theory and practice. And tomorrow, one of such imaginary opposition groups gains the power. No pain, no blood. Okay, now. What do they want to do with the advanced missile industry of the country? Throw them all into the sea? When they find Saudi, Saudi's, I mean, multi-hundred billion military purchases, when they see that atrocities in between these sheikdoms beneath the Persian Gulf, when they face the Zionists not available even to say a word about their atomic arsenal, when they realize that the US has engulfed Iran with its military bases, when they behold the cumulative militaristic advancements in Turkey, and, 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 what exactly is going to be the missile and military policy and approach of such an imaginary political system that has replaced, imagine it, I mean, in an imaginary world, the Islamic Republic? And how different that is going to be from what today is about? In my opinion, nothing. And the same we have today shall very much so be repeated.